Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Tamsin Rose, the Senior Fellow for Health at Friends of Europe. And this afternoon, we're talking about how we can promote cardiovascular health in a changed and changing world. I'm delighted that we have so many of you who have joined us live, and we're going to want to engage with you in a number of different ways. We'll be using the chat, so if you want to make an event, uh, intervention, ask a question or make a comment, please use the chat. We're tracking it and we will be using it. Um, for our speakers, we have a, a, a great program and I will take you through it and we, they're going to be engaging with you and they will be sharing their views and expertise. But let's just start talking about cardiovascular disease. Why is this so important? Well, it's the leading cause of disability and death in Europe and it accounts for about 20% of premature deaths before 65. About a third of deaths overall and it impacts 60 million people in Europe. And of course, we've spent the last two years going through a pandemic. And the one thing that's been very clear is there is a, an impact on the pandemic of people who were not able to get to screening in time, who were not able to get to their regular cardiovascular appointments. So we've got a backlog of undelivered care. And we also know that even if you had a mild infection with COVID, there is increased risks of a stroke or a cardiovascular uh, an event in the next 12 months, and I myself had COVID in January, so I'm oh, keeping an eye on this, this, and it may be over a longer period of time as well. So we, what we know is that it was already pre-pandemic, a major challenge that Europe has just not managed to get to grip with. And although mortality has been coming down recently, not equally across Europe, not equally for, for different genders, for different ethnicities, so we have an entrenched problem that we need to deal with. And today I'm delighted that we're going to be talking about the fact that we are going to launch a European cardiovascular plan for health. And I note several comments with issues with sound. I apologize. We're going to try and fix that as soon as possible so that you can hear me most, most clearly. Just to remind you, and you'll see it behind me, the hashtags for today. That's FOE debate and each four hearts. We encourage you to so we're still having some issues with the sound, and I apologize, we, we see the messages. We encourage you to engage with us on social media and to use particularly the hashtag each for hearts because today we're delighted to be the day that it launches the cardiovascular plan for Europe. So I'm now going to introduce our first speaker. And again, we are privileged to have Professor Stefan Ackenbach, who is leading both up for the European Society for Cardiology and here today is representing the European Alliance for Cardiovascular Health, which is a unique grouping of most of the organizations across Europe that deal with cardiovascular stroke and other aspects of health, who've come together with one objective, to make sure that Europe takes seriously the growing burden of cardiovascular health. So Professor Ackenberg, let me pass the floor to you. Well, thank you, Tamsin. There is gentlemen, Dear colleagues, dear distinguished commissioner, Ms. Kirikiadis, it's my pleasure to speak to you on one, on one hand as the president of the European Society of Cardiology. On the other hand, I have the honor of addressing you as a spokesperson of each, the European Alliance for Cardiovascular Health. But I'm also a practicing cardiologist at a hospital in Germany. And I would like to start my presentation a little bit unusually by showing you this arm. Now this arm, belongs to the first patient that I treated this morning. And he agreed uh, to be shown here today, but we both thought that it would not be necessary to show his face and we settled on his arm. That should be enough so I can tell you his story because this patient was born in 1968. So he's 53 years old. He works hard. He leads a very active life, but it turns out this morning he has severe coronary artery disease and he received four stents this morning in the cath lab. He has six brothers and sisters. Three brothers have died from myocardial infarction, all under the age of 55, and his sister has already undergone cardiac surgery. Also, please let me tell you that today is Monday. Monday mornings, we speak about the patients that were admitted to our department over the weekend. And among those coming in as an emergency was one 65-year-old, one 56-year-old, one 54-year-old, one 46-year-old, and one 19-year-old patient. Now, this is important 
We already heard that cardiovascular disease is frequent, causing one, more than one third of all deaths in the EU, and that 60 million people in the EU live with heart disease. And yes, cardiovascular disease is frequent in the elderly. And yes, with the aging population, we will see an avalanche of heart and vascular disease. But cardiovascular disease is also frequent in the young. Tamsin already mentioned that in women, almost 20% of all deaths under the age of 65 are cardiovascular. And about 25% of deaths in men under the age of 65 are from cardiovascular disease. Also, the patient I showed you was healthy, no particular risk factors. And while we know that risk factors influence cardiovascular disease, and in fact, the tremendous increase in obesity and diabetes that we currently see is extremely concerning regarding cardiovascular health in the population just some years from now, but many patients develop cardiovascular disease without any risk factors, and many risk factors are beyond the patient's control, such as exposure to unhealthy nutrition, noise, or air pollution. So we need to understand that while addressing risk factors on one hand, risk factors on an individual level and on a population level is one of our most, most powerful tools, it must not remain the only approach, since many patients develop cardiovascular disease without any risk factors at all. And we already heard that in the year 2022, we have to talk about COVID-19. The pandemic has shown how important health is to the population of Europe. And COVID-19 has also shown that patients with cardiovascular disease are among the most vulnerable and that resilience to future health risks, such as anything from new pandemics to climate change, such resilience to future health risks absolutely requires cardiovascular health. And the rates of cardiovascular disease and Death are not no longer declining in the EU. In some areas, they're even on the way up. So the job is not done, and we jointly need to keep on fighting for cardiovascular disease on all levels. And you probably all know the feeling of a task that is so large that you do not know where to start. And this is exactly where the each action plan for cardiovascular health comes in, providing a structure and a strategy to tackle the problem in a coordinated way. It helps by providing a coordinated approach to reduce premature and preventable deaths in Europe. To achieve this, focus will need to be on prevention at an individual and the population level, on removing inequalities across Europe by providing systematic access to risk assessment on one hand and high quality treatment, including rehabilitation on the other. And we also need a massive upscale in the quantity and quality of research. So, on behalf of the European Society of Cardiology and on behalf of the European Alliance for Cardiovascular Health, thank you very much for the interest in this plan, which is so, so desperately needed and which should provide tremendous help. And I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ackenbach. And we will be putting in the chat a link to the, the plan that's just been launched today so people can download it and read it. But thank you again for just concentrating on what this means for patients and the huge diversity of patients who are affected by cardiovascular disease. And as you say, the job is not done. Although there has been some progress on some issues linked to lifestyle, but we need to look broader at some of the other, not just individual, but society and level uh, risk factors such as, as you say, or noise, air pollution, stress, and other things that have an impact on cardiovascular disease. So the job is not done. Let me now pass over, and I'm delighted to introduce the European Commissioner for Health, Mrs. Stella Kiriakidis. The message there we got from Professor Ackenbach is, this is urgent, it's a growing burden of disease, it's likely to increase in the future, we need to understand more about it, and the job is not done. And they're calling for the next mandate, so that's 2024, to prioritise a strategy and a plan for cardiovascular health. Let me invite you to comment on that. So thank you very much for the invitation and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're coming together today at a moment where we, the unprovoked and uh, unjustified Russian invasion of Ukraine is causing a, a, a terrible human tragedy. And as always in times of war, it is the innocent, the vulnerable and the, the children who suffer the most. And those who already suffer from chronic diseases are especially affected. This is why we have already set up a solidarity mechanism to transfer patients 
from the most affected uh, EU member states to other countries, and we have transferred over 300 patients so far to 11 member, 11 member states to make sure that these people receive the care they need, both in uh, trauma and mental health support and cases of, of um, sexual violence. Now, already there are more than 6 million new cases of cardiovascular disease and over 1.8 million cardiovascular disease related deaths in the EU uh, each year. And this is placing an immense burden on our fellow citizens, on our health systems, and of course, on our economy. But before the pandemic, cardiovascular diseases were the leading cause of death in the EU and also globally. So there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that collectively as a union, we need to do more to address them, to prevent where possible, and to treat effectively. Uh, unhealthy diets, physical inactivity, smoking, and harmful alcohol consumption are the key causes of non-communicable diseases, including problems with heart health. And these factors are responsible for the overwhelming majority of Europe's disease burden. So we have to help citizens lead healthiest lifestyles and avoid disease to every extent possible. To this direction, we're supporting member states in transferring best practices on health promotion and disease prevention, including on physical activity, nutrition, uh, and other risk factors such as tobacco consumption. Let me just share some examples for you. For example, the European Physical Activity on Prescription is a project transferring 20 years of Swedish press best practice now to other member states. The Young 50 project exports the prevention and screening model for cardiovascular diseases developed in Italy to Lithuania, Romania, Luxembourg, and Spain. In fact, 20% of EU for Health program budget will be allocated to health promotion and disease prevention. And under the EU for Health work plan for 2021, last year, we have allocated 7 million euro for the transfer and implementation of validated best practices through joint, uh, two joint actions with EU countries. One on tackling diabetes type two and promoting healthy lifestyles and obesity prevention in vulnerable groups. And there will be more actions under the Commission's uh, Healthier Together initiative to help reduce um, the burden, burden of non-communicable diseases uh, across the, the EU. Uh, so really tackling these challenges demands a coordinated effort across different policy areas. And our, this year's work program supports the implementation of actions under the Healthier Together initiative with very targeted, dedicated funding of over 55 million euro for work with member states uh, and stakeholders, starting with cardiovascular disease and diabetes. A call for proposals for stakeholders will be launched in July this year on cardiovascular diseases and diabetes. And across um, uh, Europe, we know, and it is uh, very well documented, uh, the impact um, and the prevalence of cardiovascular disease. Uh, with a notably higher death rate in Central and Eastern European countries. We also see gender inequalities, with women on average more affected by cardiovascular disease than men. And again, gender gaps are more evident in Eastern European countries. So it is important that this initiative will support the reduction of health inequalities. So ladies and gentlemen, together we are taking concrete steps towards building a strong European Union a union that will be there for its citizens. Uh, we need to have joined up thinking uh, and coordination as part of health promotion and disease prevention. And uh, it is essential that non-communicable disease initiative will complement Europe's beating cancer plan in the area of health. This plan is a key pillar to the European Health Union. And in the European Code Against Cancer, which is a commission initiative to reduce to help people reduce their risk of cancer. This will also help to prevent cardiovascular diseases uh, because the plan will also develop actions 
that may benefit uh, cancer patients with cardiovascular disease as a comorbidity. As we all know, in the area of health and healthcare, digitalization is essential. And last uh, two weeks ago now, we launched another pillar of the European Health Union, our proposal of the European Health Data Space. We see this as a new paradigm shift, um, a new beginning for Europe, making health data work for citizens and health industry. And at the end of this year, we will be coming forward with the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe as part of the health union to improve access to affordable medicines and address unmet medical needs. In all of this, we need to work together. We need to be coordinated because we all know that the pandemic has been really uh, shown us the way forward, that we are stronger and more effective when we're working together. So while the pandemic is um, ongoing and as we emerge out of the most acute phase, we know that our health systems need to uh, deal with a backlog of postponed uh, non-urgent treatments and screening. These are long-term challenges in the area of cardiovascular health uh, already and especially for those people who went uh, through, through COVID-19. Uh, so we will be continuing to work very closely uh, and I want to explicitly really salute the European Alliance for Cardiovascular Health because you comprise a very broad, a very diverse group, diverse group of stakeholders uh, that come together for a common cause. And uh, your expertise and your alliance are going to be key for us in the way that we move forward. So once again, thank you for the opportunity to be able to share some thoughts with you today. And I wish you really a very fruitful discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And thank you to people who are already starting to put some comments in the chat. That's extremely helpful. And I'd like to pick up on something that I'm seeing here because we've had comments from Katerina and from Piotr making the link between cancer and cardiovascular disease. You know, um, this issue that actually subgroups of cancer patients often die of cardiovascular disease. And the commissioner has just described some key messages and key initiatives looking at the connection between diabetes and uh, cardiovascular disease. And I think that's looking at the prevention and promotion element. But what we've been picking up here in the chat is looking at, you know, the e interaction between cancer and cardiovascular disease. And of course, we have the European Beating Cancer Plan. So we're expecting to see quite a, a, a lot of progress in cancer, but be aware that there is therefore the risk of cardiovascular disease that needs to be associated. And maybe that's an area we might like to pick, it, pick up on. Uh, Julian, you've asked for the different calls and programs that were mentioned by the commissioner to be listed. I'm sure we will check with her team if we are able to share either the speaking notes or we'll be able to put some of the elements in the chat. Thank you, because there was a lot of information in uh, just five minutes there. Is there anyone who would like to uh, put a comment in the chat on what we've just heard? We've heard from, from uh, Professor Ackham back that this is a range of different people. It's a growing issue. The job is not done. And while I'm, I'm waiting to see some elements, let me give you highlights of what you will find in the each plan for European uh, cardiovascular strategy. So they are calling for a clear message by 2030, so that's in just a few years, that premature and preventable deaths in Europe from cardiovascular disease related causes would be reduced by one third. Now that's ambitious when we consider it's currently the leading cause of disability and death. So to cut that by a third is a major step forward. And they want to see that happen, that every person who's living with cardiovascular uh, risks would have an assessment through their life course and access to a care pathway that focuses on their needs and their goals. They want to institute a European cardiovascular health check so that we have this multidisciplinary approach and everyone dis understands their risk. They're also causing, uh, looking for more focus on rehabilitation and looking at quality of life and other psychosocial outcomes that need to be addressed. Um, we've heard again, Oliver's put something in the chat about how can we diagnose earlier so we can prevent the condition from being uh, more burdensome. Uh, 
Brigitte um, from the European Heart Network is saying thank you for the support from the Commissioner and making sure that patients need to be at the centre of the strategy um, and that they, the Each Alliance is committed to work with the European Commission to make this a landscape that is conducive to cardiovascular health. A couple of other elements that are in the plan, and I do encourage you all to go and download it so you can see what's in it. They're proposing a series of cross-cutting actions such as a European cardiovascular health knowledge centre so that this sharing of good practice becomes more standard across the board. They want to create an, an observatory on European cardiovascular health so we can see where the trends are going and see where we need to make most progress. Both Professor Ackenbach and the Commissioner highlighted how in some countries We've made huge progress and in other countries, particularly I'm thinking of the Baltic states and countries like Bulgaria, we have a huge inequality and growth of cardiovascular health that really needs to be dealt with. The European cardiovascular plan is calling that each country should have its own strategy or plan. And we'll hear in a, in a little bit from the scientific coordinator from Spain who's going to talk about the brand new plan that's just been adopted there and what can be delivered. Robert has mentioned it in the chat, the, the challenge of health illiteracy, the lack of basic knowledge about your own body is a, is a key issue in Central and Eastern Europe. And if you don't know about it, your own body and how it works, then of course you can't engage with health promotion or health prevention activities. So thank you for that. The each plan is calling for an incubator and progressive policy environment for digital transfer, transformation. And again, you might want to pick up on the new range of apps and other tools that can be used for home monitoring, remote monitoring and engagement. And I, I'd just like to, to comment again on somebody put in the chat at the beginning that we are an ageing society in Europe and that therefore cardiovascular health comes to the, the foreground. I just want to share that I spent most of Friday in hospital with my mother and she's 80 years old and in relatively good health but she needs a hip replacement which again is quite common with older people but one of the big issues that we need to test is whether her heart is going to be strong enough to allow the care that she would need for her hip so the aging society in Europe is going to be the oldest continent in the world by 2030 is an area where we need to make sure that cardiovascular health is absolutely central to any of the care that needs to be given in a, a multidisciplinary way to older people. Uh, Hugo's put in the chat that the cardiovascular diseases are summarized under the NCDs, the non-communicable disease, um, while cancer is considered as the prime challenge in isolation. And we need to have a, you know, a broader approach. And he's calling for a, a plan for cardiovascular disease in, under the same nature as the beating cancer plan. So thank you all for participating and engaging in this chat. And I'd like at this point now to hear a message from MEP Brando Benefe, who's recorded a short message for us. He's, of course, from the MEP Heart Group in the European Parliament. We're calling for a response at European level. The job is not can't done. That's what Professor Ackenbach said. So let's now hear what MEP Benefe would like to say. As we slowly emerge from the COVID-19 crisis into a new Europe, and as we are re-examining the importance of health and health systems or our way of life, we recognize this wake-up call for the European Union to address the persistent and exponential burden of cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is the biggest health challenge in the EU. Patients living with cardiovascular disease and people at risk were disproportionately affected by the pandemic with long-term consequences. There is evidence to suggest that even mild cases of COVID can make elevate risks of heart disease. This health challenge uh, uh, reflects wider issues and questions about health system sustainability and inequalities in Europe. As the EACH plan on cardiovascular health launched today highlights, there are huge differences in death rates between countries. There is also evidence of inequalities between socioeconomic and ethnic groups. The pandemic showed the importance of good health to allow people and societies to thrive and shift our views of health and the way we interact with health systems. We need to move from focusing on disease to focusing on the person, to move from a cardiovascular disease to a cardiovascular health approach for people navigating the, ent the entire care pathway. In the new European Health Union, we need action and bold policies to promote cardiovascular health. This means we need to set standards for the use so that no one is left behind. 
We need to build a strong and resilient post-pandemic health system through the next generation of the European Health Union, where cardiovascular health is everyone's business. Cardiovascular health is important to, for everyone at all ages. So we need to strengthen social cohesion, the right to timely access to affordable, preventive and curative health uh, care of good quality. If we have a healthier European Union, we have a better European Union. Thank you very much to MEP Benefe. And as we, we know, within the MEP Heart Group, they're very strongly supportive of this new initiative and will be following up. Of course, it was launched today, the new plan, and over the next 18 months, there will be a series of activities and a campaign to make this a clear priority for the incoming parliament after the new elections and the new mandate. So expect to see a lot more activity in the parliament coming up. Now I'd like to um, in introduce Professor Hector Bueno. We we've just been talking about the importance of having a strategy and a plan. You don't know what you're going to achieve unless you actually measure it and you plan for it. And you are the scientific coordinator for the newly introduced national strategy for cardiovascular health in Spain. Professor Bueno, tell us a little bit about that, the process, and what you hope it would achieve. Well. First of all, thank you very much for, uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Health of Spain, the, on all the people involved in the development of, of this uh, strategy, to uh, present our, uh, for the first time, actually, our strategy and to share it with you. Uh, as uh, you may know, Spain has a healthcare system which is uh, decentralized with 17 regions. So uh, the strategies are developed to uh, promote uh, national cohesion and, and the uh, providence of healthcare and the equity. So it, it is developed by the ministry and approved by the interterritorial inter board of the 17 communities. This is uh, uh, the way of, uh, how these uh, 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 strategies are developed. So this is the first time ever that there's a, a national strategy on cardiovascular health. So far, there had been only cardi strategies on cardiovascular disease, particularly ischemic heart disease, which is the main killer in the society. But we decided to make a, a, a major change. Uh, uh, first, in terms of adapting what were the needs of our uh, the society, and it was mentioned, we have an older uh, an aging society with more and more older people, people with multi-morbidities, uh, more dependent peoples, and we have healthcare systems which are basically hospital-centered and which are very well fit for the management acute patients and very sick patients of those needing uh, complex interventions, but not definitely by the more and more patients that we have for the provider that I just mentioned. For that, we actually shifted our strategy and philosophy, uh, moving from disease to health, moving from patients to citizens, moving from the healthcare system to the society, and moving from healthcare professionals and patients to all actors involved, to promote a, 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 a culture of health, cardiovascular health in this particular, in this particular case in the society, but also in terms of integrated, coordinated, and multidisciplinary care when it's uh, within the system. The strategy was developed by more than 100 people, uh, uh, not only cardiovascular healthcare professionals, cardiologists, surgeons, and all, but also non cardiovascular professionals, nurses, but also all, uh, many other professionals, including those involved in innovation, management, and so on, like engineers, managers, economists, and patients, of course. Uh, we need to get rid of the traditional paternalistic approach of uh, health provision. Uh, so we asked the groups, we divided them in teams, and asked to decide what were they thinking about the critical points needed in cardiovascular health, and to select them and make a priority. Uh, so, with that, uh, we uh, developed a structure which, uh, on the backbone, on continuity of care, patient safety, and uh, information systems, and in, uh, definitely we need information and data collection, accurate data. We have the tra transfers are exits, 
which were mainly health promotion, prevention and early disease detection, citizen empowerment and participation, knowledge management, uh, research development and innovation, equity, comprehensive approach for persons with acute cardiovascular disease and with chronic cardiovascular disease. And we had also seven longitudinal lines, which was cardiovascular health promotion, prevention and citizen empowerment, knowledge management and uh, uh, the uh, cardiovascular uh, advances in research development and innovation, equity, particularly gender equity, which is uh, one of the major needs in cardiovascular health and disease, and four specific uh, cardiovascular syndromes, which were ischemic heart disease, heart failure, arrhythmias and sudden death, and heart valve disease. With these, we created a matrix in which these were interacted. And uh, so we had uh, the scopes of action for those we decided and we prioritized 27 critical points. There were strategic aims with 32 general objectives and 67 specific objectives, uh, 134 specific actions. And as you mentioned before, uh, if we don't measure, we don't know where we are going or where we are. So we actually developed 61 indicators, uh, uh, and all of these was put into, into, into strategic maps. It would be de definitely too long to mention all these points, mm -hmm. just to mention uh, just a few how health promotion is dedicated to uh, improving healthy lifestyles in the society, diet, physical activity, working uh, on education, regulation, fiscal policies, uh, creating healthier environments and schools, workplaces, cities, uh, improving and increasing the role of primary care in population education and primary prevention, early cardiovascular detection, and so on. I would love to uh, mention many of these. Uh, for instance, in terms of cardiovascular diseases, we thought that early diagnosis of atrial fibrillation was uh, uh, prevention of a stroke was essential. Also early detection of valvular heart disease, moving cardiac rehabilitations out of the hospital for, uh, uh, for uh, low risk uh, uh, patients with uh, coronary artery disease, multidisciplinary teams for the management of patients with heart failure or valvular disease, and so on. There would be several things I think I okay. would go beyond the time allocated. So uh, that's just a, a glimpse of what we are trying to do in Spain. Thank you, Professor Buena. It's really interesting to hear how it was put together and how it, you engage you know, different disciplines, patients and others in helping to define what should be in it. And if it's possible, uh, we'd love to have a link in the chat to the uh, uh, Spanish cardiovascular health plan because it could be a really interesting plan that could be adopted elsewhere. And I, I note we've had, again, lots of comments coming in in the chat. We've had a, a comment from Neil saying, you know, it, we need to look at childhood and genetic risks because if we do that, we could prevent 30 percent uh, of some of the challenges somebody else Nico has talked about you know there's this AI has huge promise how can we reduce the gap between these promising new technologies that could give us precision medicine and actual care being given so I'm look, looking to see how we can bring technology in so thank you again for lots of the elements that are coming in the chat and I will be opening up for your contributions in a few minutes but before I do I'd like to invite uh, the MEP USS Elekas from uh, Lithuania to share some input you know, for the European uh, Heart Hub in the European Parliament We've just heard from Spain, this amazing you know, national strategy, and they're very clear what they want to achieve and how to achieve it. Lithuania is a country where the statistics on cardiovascular disease are not good. So there's obviously some work to be done. How, what's the added value for you of European action that could impact on the national environment? Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to participate in this uh, conference. Indeed. Uh, the uh, cardiovascular disease is very important for all Europe, uh, but also for my country, Lithuania. And, and looking from here, from the Brussels, I, I would like to, to repeat that this is critical to emphasize that these diseases have a social and national ladder. 
there are significant uh, disparities uh, in uh, access to the cardiovascular diseases, diagnosis, treatment, uh, and follow-up that can have uh, disastrous uh, consequences. And uh, we can act uh, alone, or have, we have unite our efforts. And the proposal from, from the Commission to um, be more involved in uh, uh, this issue on the European level, I think it's, it's very, very important. The European Commission, for example, is addressing non-communicable disease through the initiative Healthy Together, which are a particular focus on cardiovascular disease, and as was mentioned, diabetes. And for my country, it's really very important not only act with our resources, but also have the uh, expertise, have the, the practice, have the communication with uh, the colleagues in, in, in different um, uh, countries. And uh, we can uh, learn a lot from, from the, the, the COVID pandemic. I think it's also, it's also a very, very good example how we can uh, unite our efforts uh, and uh, implement for the cardiovascular diseases uh, the same. And uh, I think this is was very important. Uh, I think we were talking in the first hour meeting about the, the, the conference on the future of Europe. Uh, and uh, citizens panel shows that citizens of the European Union are striving for the health union that is uh, holistic and will assist uh, us uh, not only in the international health disease disasters, but also in every day our citizens' life. And uh, uh, as was mentioned, that the struggle against the cardiovascular diseases is far from, from, from the end. The EU for, uh, for health or horizontal, the horizon Europe can utilize research and innovation investment to enhance cardiovascular health on European level and on the national level and address health inequities on a cross-border scale. You mentioned that someone mentioned in the child that uh, genetic in, in the research. It's very important, but I think it's more effective to, to do just genetic uh, altogether. And you can count on my support to ensure that we leverage on the opportunities afforded by the initiative to guarantee that citizens through the Euro benefit from, from this movement after all, uh, a healthy society is uh, beneficial not only for our population health, but also for the economic perspectives, as Commissioner mentioned. And I think that uh, uh, no one uh, member state alone, it's not so effective than when we act uh, together. And I hope that we will reach this uh, understanding by the European Union. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Olekas. As, as you say, there's a lot that needs to be shared at European level and a lot more that could be done. Uh, let me now uh, introduce Joanne Fleming because she's here to talk about Young 50. And that was an initiative that was referenced by the Commissioner as an example of good practice. This is an initiative from Italy that's now being shared in other countries and applied in, in different contexts. So, Joanne, please go ahead. You're on mute. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm as you have said, I'm going to give an example of cardiovascular screening in practice. And as everybody has said so far, COVID has forced us to reappraise the value of health promotion and disease prevention. Young 50 is an action of the third EU health programme. The aim is to transfer the Italian Cardio 50 best practice to other member states. The Young 50 uh, Cardiovascular Screening and Prevention Programme envisages a series of brief objective measurements to perform cardiovascular risk assessment and stratification, personalised counselling on healthy lifestyle and support in improving identified risk factors and follow up. The programme is addressed to people aged 50. This is an age when many are busy with their lives and can miss warning signs and overlook risk factors but there's still time for decisive action. The aim is to reach 50 year olds with lifestyle related risk factors that are modifiable, smoking, excess consumption of alcohol, inactivity, unhealthy diet. Participants commit to improving one risk factor of their preference. Experience has shown that attempting to improve more than one risk factor at a time 
can be counterproductive. Participants are consequently motivated to engage in their own healthcare, creating greater awareness. The invitation to participate is universal and free of charge with the aim to promote equitable services and equitable access. Invitation are not sent to 50 year olds who are already being treated for cardiovascular risk. The program has been taken on by board by three other member states, Lithuania, Luxembourg and Romania. Uh, the program is adapted to the local setting after a structured needs and feasibility assessment and includes stakeholder involvement. The resulting three local promoters are quite different from each other. One is led by an NGO in Romania, one by a community clinic in Lithuania, and one by the Ministry of Health in Luxembourg. Rollout was originally planned for early spring 2020, which unfortunately coincided with the COVID outbreak. So it had clearly had to be postponed. Screening eventually started in September 2021 and is hindered again by the COVID related restrictions. Nonetheless, we have noticed that the teams are strongly motivated to pursue this activity. At the start of the, on the subject of digitalization, for example, one interesting point maybe is that we discussed the possibility of digitalizing young 50 to ensure rollout because of the COVID. Um, but digitalization needs to be used with care in this particular age group. Uh, the in-person encounter is particularly important feature of Cardio 50 best practice. Other aspects of the process could instead be digitalized. Uh, again, on the question of um, digitalization, preference has been shown for in-person activities because part of the support uh, that is given to the participants who commit to improving one of their risk factors is to join a group, maybe to, dis to stop smoking or mm -hmm. to, uh, to improve nutrition. Uh, and preference has been shown for in-person activities to support these uh, rather than, they would rather have, uh, take part in a group rather than attend a webinar. This warrants exploration because it may simply be a reaction to COVID-19 related isolation and uh, social distancing. So people wanted to get back in touch with other people. Okay. Uh, it's also important to create synergies uh, by including, for example, as we have done in most of the countries, the best practice as one of a series of screening programs offered by the local health authorities. And also by seeking common ground with complementary schemes uh, there was mention of the OPAP project, and we are in um, monthly um, liaison with the OPAP group so that we can sort of try and create synergies with this group, which is um, promoting physical activity on prescription. Um, Great. I think that's it. Thank, Thank you. you, Joanne. Very Thank interesting you. to hear how each country has taken some of the core elements from what, what was developed in Italy and is applying them in different ways. The leadership and ownership and accountability is different in each country. And I think that shows us how Europe can act as a, a mechanism to allow this sharing of good practice. Now, uh, the, the chat is very lively. We've got lots of people who, who've got uh, things to say. And also we've got two people who've got their hands up. And just a few things I wanted to pick up on from, from the chat. Um, somebody's mentioned the importance of rehabilitation and after event care. When you think about the number of people who had a, a cardiovascular event, such as stroke, then we need to be managing the post event care to ensure well being. And again, we've ha had a mention in, in the chat that the Young 50 campaign works really well, but there's 2 million people with a, a genetic risk. Um, and for them, reaching 50 may not be attainable because of that. So there's uh, lots of challenging issues to come forward. Um, I have a short video, and I'm going to uh, play that first from a stroke survivor. And then I'm going to be coming to Magdalena Dacour and Birg uh, Birgit Bega, who've both got their hands up. But let's just first watch that short video. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Greta Lunde and I'm a stroke survivor and I'm rep uh, representing the Stroke Alliance for Europe. My question today is that with all the great advances we have seen in stroke research, we are now saving more lives after stroke across Europe. Many of us, however, suffer lifelong disability and need lifelong rehabilitation, treatment and care once we have left the hospital gates. 
Please, uh, could you tell me how the EU will prioritize this? After all, a life saved must be a life worth living. Thank you. Thank you. A very valuable question and I think highlights the points that we've had in the chat to say we need to look at quality of life. We look need to look at post-stroke or post-cardiovascular event. Magdalena, can I invite you to make your a brief contribution? Thank you so much. Um, Magdalena de Koch from FH Europe. I'm representing today a community across wider Europe with a network of 29 patient organizations. People we advocate for were born, are born with uh, inherited genetic CVD risk factors, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, high cholesterol, inherited high cholesterol, and elevated lipoprotein A. Until now, except for the chat, I, I must admit very openly, I've been saddened and almost terrified not to hear any reference to genetic risk factors, the reason for easily uh, preventable heart attacks, strokes, and premature death. And ladies and gentlemen, when I say premature death, I also mean children. Um, as a member, as a partner of each, I am uh, delighted that we have put together the, 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 the plan and the plan, the action plan addresses the importance of early screening. And as you said, Tamsin, reaching 50 for many of our uh, citizens in Europe is a goal which they will not achieve. FH, familial hypercholesterolemia, affects one in 300 people across Europe, but two, less than 10% of those people are being detected, identified. As Neil Johnson said in the chat, it's a low hanging fruit, a genetic risk factor which can easily be detected through universal pediatric screening programs, where those are already implemented across quite a number of member states successfully. And when I say pediatric screening programs, it's not only about preventing cardiovascular in children, the disease in children, but also in their parents. Detecting a child early with a risk factor will allow us to find through cascade screening models, detecting their parents before they develop heart attack, stroke, or maybe even prematurely die. Therefore, okay. My call to everyone here is to put on the map the importance of including cholesterol and inherited risk factors in prevention programs to avoid unnecessary consequences of CVD. Thank you, Tamsin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Magdalena, again, reminding us of the whole spectrum of cardiovascular disease risk. Um, and we have a number of people who've asked to speak, and I just want to remind you, we've got 10 minutes left. So, Birgit, I'm going to come to you. Then I have Arto Furtado from the European Commission and Verica Kraje from uh, Croatia. So, Birgit, go ahead. Thank you, Tamsin. Thank you, Tamsin. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Well, it is a, a, a wonderful to hear the support from the Commission to, to move forward on CVD. We, we all have been waiting for, for that good message because it is a very uh, huge economic burden which uh, lasts on our citizens and it is aggravated by any kind of uh, circumstances, be it COVID, be it climate change or be it war conditions because uh, these people are hit uh, 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 among the worst of all. So it's a great vulnerability and it is wonderful the Commission starts to think and have this uh, consultation with all stakeholders to, to see what we can bring to the pay table. And as we heard, we need we need everything. We need very specific action, primary prevention, screening, uh, genetic conditions, secondary prevention. We need uh, um, uh, a CBD research, of course. And last but not least, we, we need to work all together. So it's great to hear about the political leadership taken also supported by the European Parliament. And I'm delighted uh, that I think we are moving towards the idea to have a European policy, a healthier uh, together, a European health union, so important. And I think we are at a landslide a change. Uh, we, it's, it's an historic moment we have. We have to grasp this opportunity and bring health forward to our citizens by looking forward what is what needs to be done in health where is the patient outcomes what what does make sense where we can take bring quality to life uh, to to the patient but also to the society overall and last but not least we have some help with innovation on digital health we can bring uh, multidisciplinary uh, teams of healthcare professionals to uh, um, regions with a uh, lower 
um, um, let's say, capacities in healthcare. We can connect people, have uh, remote consultation and monitoring. So there are some instruments we need to 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 uh, modernize and to have a healthy healthcare pathway. So we bring uh, citizens' uh, health forward, and it's it's now the time to, to act on it. So I'm very happy to see this all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Birgitta. Arthur, if I could invite you to join us. We've got a lot of expectations and ambitions for what the EU could do in its next mandate and expect a lot of phone calls and emails, expect a lot of pressure in the next 24 months to get that message through. But what would you like to share? Thank you very much. This has been a very interesting um, discussion so far. I would like to make four telegraphic points. The first one to remind everybody that we have been working in the last six months since December in a new innovative initiative. The commissioner has mentioned it, it's called Healthier Together. And it's one major ambitious innovative way of trying to address the burden of non-communicable diseases, helping the member states achieve more. It basically does the following. On one pillar, identifies actions that we know can be important and effective in this area. And so it will provide inspiration and guidance for the member states to do more. And then the other pillar is identifying what tools, legal and financial, can there be to make these ideas come to reality. So it's really a very practical document. That's the ambitious part of it. And it's also about making things happen in real life. Now, the other thing that we would like to, to mention in terms of ambition and innovation is that the, the way this has been drafted until now, it has been really a co-drafting process, a very collaborative with many of the NGOs and associations that are around the table today, and also with the member states. We have been spending these six months actually working together, changing and drafting the, the documents side by side. We are going to present it on the 22nd of June, so I really hope that you can all be there together. Very quickly, and happy to discuss it more, of course, if we have time, the second point would be to say that the objective overall of this initiative is to raise the bar for all. This is not about the minimum common denominator. It's really about achieving more for the citizens here in Europe, but that's what makes sense. So we are inviting and we are gathering things that are more ambitious in terms of population-wide interventions, in terms of system-wide improvements and reforms. Third point, I think you will be glad to know that many, if not all, of the points that were discussed today from prevention, uh, prevention that focuses on the choice environment and not increases the burden on, on the individual, but also about screening, about better patient pathways and about integrated care and about self and better management. All of these have been identified as priorities by the member states and by the stakeholders. And there is a possibility, if the document is embraced as it is, that we will be working together in, in these areas. And the, my last point to say that also what we have been listening to is there, meaning knowing that we have very good examples already coming from Spain, coming from other countries, but also from projects that we have financed ourselves, like the prescription um, of physical activity. We, this is, these are just a couple of examples. We also know that we have the best buys from the WHO. We have projects that have been evaluated by the OECD. So we have compiled all of these, and the idea is that we learn from each other, we replicate these good examples at a wider scale, and we use the teams between the member states so that we can move further and faster than, than before with the support of the European institutions from the Commission, from the Parliament. Thank you very much. I will try to make this uh, very condensed Thank you. Uh, intervention. Thank you, Arthur. It's very useful for you to, to have, you know, done a quick summary of the different areas that are work. But you know what? It occurs to me very clearly is these are all small pieces of the puzzle and the message that our stakeholders are saying is you need a plan you need a strategy it all needs to come together on it with a very clear focus on what we do on on cardiovascular health i have two more people that i would like to bring in before we close in five minutes and that's verica and jean-luc lemercier verica can i invite you to uh, open your microphone and briefly share what you want to say yeah thank you um, 
I am here as a member of Italians, and uh, as I'd like to echo first what uh, Birgit said to thanks, uh, Commissioner uh, Kyriakides, to be with us today and to support these initiatives from the Italians. And I'll have um, another comment and a follow-up question very briefly. My comment in, in her address, Commissioner said that Europe has invested um, in prevention for cardiovascular disease, on lifestyle, improving lifestyle, better uh, no tobacco sport, all the fundamental to avoid cardiovascular disease. The second element she mentioned um, is the European Commission is channeling some funds through different vehicles in order to address, to facilitate some project in order to stop, defeat, improve cardiovascular disease treatment. And I, I, the, my question is to the commissioner, would she consider as a success for this European money, which is going to be used by the, the member state to have several countries coming back to the European Commission asking for pilot for early detection of cardiovascular in Europe? Is this money would be uh, well spent if the country are coming back with this type of program? Thank you, Desmond. Uh, thank you, Jean-Luc. And uh, unfortunately, the commissioner has had to leave us and so isn't still online and can't answer. What I can in invite to do is we will take that message and pass it forward. And certainly, uh, Arthur, if I can invite you from the commission to, to undertake to pass this message forward to say um, it would be useful to know what, what's been the added value, what has been the, the impact of working with individual countries rather than to do it all at European level. We have a couple of more people I'd like to bring in. So we have Robert Hatala from Slovakia. Would you like to open your microphone and share? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the possibility to place here uh, to this distinguished audience. My comment is, is very brief. I think the last two years of the pandemics have shown us very clearly that we have a huge heterogeneity uh, across Europe in terms of trust into medical science. Uh, we have seen that uh, when confronted with a potentially lethal disease like COVID-19, uh, in some countries, uh, two thirds of the population were opposed to uh, vaccination. Uh, I believe uh, this is a clear indicator that we need a much better education uh, about uh, our own body. Uh, of the whole po population. And we have to start at the elementary level. We have to start in the elementary schools, uh, changing the curriculum in biological sciences for, for, the, for the young people. Otherwise, how do you want to implement all these recommendations based on scientific evidence if people uh, do not believe into medical science? Thank you very much. Thank you, you've, Robert. You've raised that very important uh, point that what we're seeing is an increase in skepticism and an increase of people who say they don't believe the science or rejected some of these scientific messages. And this, this is clearly this disconnect between what people believe and what they want to accept is going to be difficult if we then want to do lifestyle campaigns, health promotion, information about getting families in to come for screening. All of that is undermined if we don't have a trust in science, in medical research and advice that comes from government bodies on what to do. So thank you, Robert, for raising that. That is indeed a, 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 an additional challenge that would need to be put in place for all of the elements that are addressed under, under health literacy. Would anyone li else like to share a, a, a comment or a question that we would like to discuss in this? Uh, Verica, I think we, we had you wanted to, your hand was up. Do we have Verica? From Croatia? If not, I mean, uh, Professor Achenbach, maybe I could come back to you. At the, at the beginning, you shared the story of some of the patients that were just admitted over the weekend. If, if I had a magical time machine and I could fast forward to 2030, and let's assume that in 2024, when we've got the next new mandate, we've got that political commitment to do something. And the European Cardiovascular Plan, which says we should reduce disabilities and deaths by a third by 2030, what do you hope your Monday morning meeting, talking about patient intake, would say? 
Well, first of all, I would hope that there are many less patients that we need to take care of acutely, that we can manage their conditions because they have been recognized early before they damage the heart and impact the patient's lives. That would be my primary wish. And I think we heard today that the burden of cardiovascular disease in the population in the European Union is so tremendous that we need many, many different approaches to tackle them. Birger Becker said we need everything. We heard that screening right after birth is important, and we heard at the other end of the spectrum, just as justified, that taking care of those patients, all the elderly who already have disease, is equally important. So we need everything is one thing we can say, or there are many options to tackle the burden of cardiovascular disease is a more positive way of spinning it. And to give the focus on the best possible cardiovascular health, rather than focusing on disease, was a very interesting aspect that I've heard from a lot of participants today. Best optimal cardiovascular health for the population, for the individual who is healthy at the moment, and also for those who already have cardiovascular disease. So these were very, very important points that I took away as a big motivation for me personally, and for us as a group, for the ESC and for each uh, very, very positive motivation. And uh, MEP Olekas has said, uh, nothing is as effective, as effective as acting together. And I think this is something that we really take away from today. Thank you for that. And I just wanted to highlight some additional elements that we've had in the chat. We had a message from Garrett who explained, you know, the realities of, of a family member, of what it was like through their lifetime. Their, their, their link to high cholesterol and their genetic risk was not addressed so that by the age of 60, they weren't there. Their disability was such they couldn't even carry groceries. That's a huge impact on quality of life. And this could be prevented by early information, screening, better promotion and prevention so that we get better quality of life. Uh, Professor Bueno, you, you mentioned that the approach to the national plan in Spain, and I noted it down because I thought this is really interesting, you're moving from disease to health. And of course, one of the great criticisms of our health systems is that they focus on disease rather than on well-being. You talked about shifting from patients to citizens, which allows us to pick up on some of the things that people have mentioned in the chat, childhood, family, understanding the, the network of disease. You talked about shifting from healthcare systems to society, that that's the place where health is created and made. And you talked about moving away from Help where healthcare professionals have responsibility to, to all of society being included. And I, I just want to, if you can help us understand that radical mental shift that was, the, that was involved in doing that. And if you could leave us with those key inspirations, because what, what's been raised by lots of different people today is exactly what you've spoken about. So how did you get that radical shift? Well, it, it's a reflection on, on the future of the healthcare system. Uh, I think that the, the starting point is just the healthcare system is not sustainable as it is anymore. Uh, the uh, population is changing. The way that we developed the system the, uh, last uh, century, uh, many decades ago, really centered in acute care when actually the epidemiology, the uh, profile of patients was diff uh, very different. And actually, the social values was different. I think just that do not fit, does not fit the needs of the actual society in one hand. On the other hand, it is not sustainable. It, it is just the uh, uh, just uh, this kind of uh, uh, hospital center system is, is just too expensive to and, and is not the best, the best place to manage the patients that we are having now older uh, with uh, multimorbidity dependent uh, this is not a place where we want to have i mean you just mentioned your your mama or your dad uh, uh, that, that, that's uh, it is very well to get the the, the difficult interventions on where they're sick but there's not a place where they should be. So we need to expand and try to get first the society involved in health. And I always say as a cardiologist, my best success success would be to have no patients. But that, that's not going to happen. But actually, if we can shift the, our patients to the oldest and, the, uh, and leave better until the end, and then at the, some point they will develop 
cardiovascular disease or cancer or some often, then we have to provide the best care. And the best care is not the acute setting that we're used in very super aggressive interventions and then not much on returning home. And for that, we need to consider the, and that, that's a critical point, the view of the citizens and the view of the patients. We need to uh, move uh, uh, beyond our traditional indicators on quality of care on, on uh, of outcomes, uh, which are needed, but we need to uh, take into consideration the patient perspective, the patient expectations and their needs. And that actually uh, moves us to, uh, to their homes, to how can we help them to, to live better and safer at home. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bueno. It was very, as, as you say, the, the aim should be to have cardiologists having very few patients, uh, having much better health for citizens throughout the life course. So let me just r wrap up some of the comments. It's, it's clear that we need work, uh, the job is not done, and there's an enormous amount of work to be done. We've had comments about the, we need new research and scientific discovery because we, there's a 20-year gap. There hasn't been much new that's come forward in, in that time, so we need to be working on independent research to understand more about it. We need the data to be able to track what's happening and understand you know, how outcomes change. Um, we also need that, that data and that information to help build health literacy and understanding amongst the population to understand more about what heart health is, how they can take care of themselves. We also know we need to much better genetic screening. We need to be looking at, at whole family risk areas. We need, in addition, better promotion and prevention. And then we need to understand we need better uh, pathways for care and any after event rehabilitation and support for people living with to have the uh, cardiovascular disease so they can have good quality of life so there's an enormous amount to be gained if we can get an appropriate strategy at european level which is measurable which has policy makers accountable for the change and which allows this all of society response, which was so nicely described by Professor Bueno. And we very much look forward to the Spanish plan being published, not least with a summary in English, so we can use this as an inspiration for other countries. I want to say a warm thank you for everyone joining us today. And just to remind you that today is the launch of the European Cardiovascular Plan, with, and it's a call for action. It's not going to happen immediately, and we have a window of time. We're now in mid-2022, and by 2024, we want this to be a central element of the incoming mandate for the next Parliament and the Commission. And you all will play a part on this to raise the profile and push for the message. And I just want to leave you with the element that, and this is taken from the, from the, the, the plan put forward by the European Cardiovascular uh, Alliance. The success and impact of the European Cardiovascular Health Plan will be shaped not only by what is achieved over the next years, but also how it is achieved, leaving no one and no country behind. The plan must address societal barriers, underserved populations, discrimination on all grounds, and the fundamental inequalities that pervade our health systems. And that's what's at stake. If we can get that right, we will have a huge impact and benefit for health for European citizens. So I want to say a warm thank you for those who spoke today, who shared so generously in the chat. Keep up the action. We look forward to engaging with you all in the next two years to make the European Cardiovascular Plan a reality and a priority for the next EU mandate. Thank you all and see you soon. Thank you.